Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, both of you. That song was by Mr. Kurt Cobain. Now, that kid's got a future, huh? How about Quang Yi on guitar, ladies and gentlemen? Give it up, Quang Yi! Give it up, Quang. You know, I'd like to take it down a little right now. What do you say, girls, huh? This is actually the first song I've ever written. And it's written for a guy to sing. Now, I know a lot of you guys out there tonight. A lot better than some of you would care to admit. And I know that a few of you kick some karaoke ass. So, if you're looking for your big breakout single, oh, you might want to put a bid on this one tonight, ladies and gentlemen, because we are talking to Phil Collins' people, right? Hmm? But then again, aren't we all? You know the sun is in your eyes And hurricanes and rain And black and cloudy skies You're running up and down that hill You turn it on and off that will There's nothing And welcome to Book versus Movie. This is a podcast where we read books that have been adapted into movies, and then we try to decide which we like better, the book or the movie. I am Margo P. of ColoniaBook.com, and this is my good friend and co-host, Margo P. of Brooklyn Fitchick. Hi, everyone. We are um, officially kicking off March 2023, depending on when you're listening to this. And that means it's time for musicals in March. We do Broadway musicals uh, or films that have been adapted from Broadway musicals. And in a theater, as we've said before, the script is called The Book. Yep. So it is still book versus movie. In this case, we're talking about a script. And we decided when the pandemic started that we will do a brand new episode every single week. And that means we need ideas, folks. We're always looking for ideas. Even for this month, we're still not decided on what musicals we're planning to cover this March. And so if you have ideas for films that we could cover, the adaptations of, if you have suggestions, ideas you'd like to share for um, films that we could do this year. We are always looking for ideas. There's a few places where you can share them with us. We have a couple of ground rules. Number one, it has to be um, a fairly short source, you know, um, not a 400 page book, but um, it could be a magazine article or a play or a, a song. As long as it's been adapted into a movie, it has to be something that we can get our hands on pretty easily. We want everybody to be able to access all of the material and the movie has to be streaming someplace. Um, so with those ground rules in mind, if you would like to meet other listeners of this podcast, interact with us, share your ideas, there's a few places where you can do that. Yes, we do have a basic Facebook page. Be sure to like it. All the episodes are posted there right away. But we also have a private Facebook group. And in the Facebook group, it's private. You do have to ask to join, but we just talk about books and movies there and we talk about movie stars and, and fun stuff like that. And people love to share ideas. Uh, Thaddeus, our super fan, is uh, pinned up at the top of the page. All the episodes pretty much that we could think of that we've covered in the past. So thank you, Thaddeus. We're on Twitter, book versus movie, and Instagram, book versus movie. And in both of those places, you spell out book versus a movie. And we have an old-timey email it's book versus movie podcast spell it all out at gmail.com and if you would like some stickers 
please send us an email. We'll be happy to drop them off to you wherever you are in the world or send us your ideas there. Either way, we'd be really appreciative. And somebody, by the way, Margo, somebody emailed me this week and asked for stickers, but they didn't give me their address. And I replied, but I didn't hear back. So oopsie. Oopsie. So uh, please, yeah, reach out. And once again, we do love suggestions. And uh, yes, please keep page length in mind. We're not going to be covering like War and Peace or The Hobbit anytime soon. It's... Not the way things are right now for the both of us. And if you really enjoy the show and would like to help keep us in books and movies, you can also support us on Patreon. And don't we have a new Patreon member? We do indeed. Her name is Anne. Anne, thank you so much for joining. Margo and I have been doing the shows. It's our ninth year. And so everything from 2020 and to previous to that is going up on that Patreon wall. Quite a few things of the old, old stuff are free. You can feel free to check it out if you just want to see what's up there. But I want to thank Anne and others who help us because this helps us with books and movies. We have just uh, Saturday Night Fever just went up there, The Warriors. We just have some really fun episodes and it just helps us, keeps us in books and movies. But we understand if money is tight, if you could just leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts, be sure to subscribe, that sort of thing. That would be amazing. Every time you mention The Warriors, I want to go watch that movie. Isn't it great? I love that. I love that movie. That was fun. (laughs) That was a really fun one. (laughs) And today's is also a really fun one, not shot in Brooklyn, but set in New York City. And we are going to be talking today about Hedwig and the Angry Inch. I am very excited to talk about this one. Have you ever seen it besides the movie? Did you ever see the I've never seen it. No, I have never seen it. I could have seen it. I had the opportunity to see it, but we never actually did. Um, We'll talk a little bit about the production of this, how this musical evolved um, in just a little minute. But most people know Hedwig, of course, from the revival. I mean, it's a revival, the Broadway Mm -hmm. production, which was a good, when did the, when did Neil Patrick Harris, it was like eight years ago or something like that. 2014, I was there. I. Oh, did you go? I went. Oh yeah, you went. Yeah. How was it? It was fantastic. This is some of the best music you'll ever hear. It's really good. Uh, it's really, really good. Yeah. And Neil Patrick Harris was great. I mean, it's so interesting. And we're going to get all into it, like how this show got started. It's such a calling card. I don't know about you, but like with my friends to be like, oh, well, I saw it at Jane Street, you know, in 98. 99. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I didn't Back know it. When, when the meatpacking district smelled like meat. Remember those days? Remember those days? There was a flower district that was really pretty. There's, mm-hmm. New York is an organism that's just always changing. It's always, yep. it, it's always in motion. It's always, so there was this very interesting time in the 90s where, uh, where arts, there was still kind of shady areas where you could create art. New York has not been artist friendly for a while. You really do need to either inherit somebody's apartment or you need to come from money. It's very hard to live in this city without it. It's like billionaire town now, it but is. it didn't used to be. I mean, when you and I, even when you and I moved there in the 90s, like you could afford to be right out of college or even in college and sharing an apartment with a few of your friends and you could afford to live in what's now billionaire town. The nineties was kind of an interesting period. You and I can speak to this, I think pretty, Mm -hmm. (laughs) pretty um, from experience. The eighty. well, let's talk about the eighties in New York because the eighties was another really interesting time with New York had a lot of crime. It was very seedy. I remember visiting times square in the eighties and it was like, you wouldn't believe it if you've if you've visited it, if you've only seen it since after in the 21st century. It was like another world. It was so it was seedy with the capital, everything, a lot of crime, um, but also a lot of like really important art. You had, you know, artists like um Warhol. Schnabel and Basquiat and Warhol were still really Warhol was kind of an elder statesman of mm-hmm. the art scene. Um, and there was a lot of evolution in the lgbtqia um culture as well that was way ahead of everything else going on in the u.s way years miles ahead of everything else in the 90s when you and i were there we had um 
there was this guy who became the mayor. I mean, you may have heard of him. <laughs> his name was Rudolf Giuliani. Was he still married to his cousin, or was I think it was he was married to Donna Hanover? By he was then, married right? to Donna, the actress who was on Law and Order a few times. Yeah, and she was on morning television. She was like a TV host as well. Shout out to Donna Hanover. But anyway, Rudy. He was not the buffoon that he is today, but his whole thing then was that he was this, this, again, this is before the trade center attack. This is before he Mm -hmm. was America's mayor. Um, And then he was just New York city's mayor. So he became mayor and all of a sudden um, his, his whole thing is like, I'm an, I'm a prosecutor. I'm tough on crime. And so when he, it was a total kind of a revolution in that it was all of a sudden there were cops everywhere. I was like, overnight, there were so many more police officers. And yes, they um, cracked down on crime, but they also had an impact. I'm trying to be really careful with my words here. They also had an impact on young people, marginalized communities who were starting to gain a voice, starting to um, express themselves in the arts and get kind of like some backing and legit cred we talked recently about bringing the noise bringing the funk mm-hmm. uh august Wilson, you know but uh there was a lot of art going on in the the mid to late 90s in the juliana juliani years before the trade center attack about his kind of authoritarian mindset at least mm-hmm. you know if not um policies and people were really feeling people were really feeling feeling the squeeze of that. So there was a lot of art going on about that at time. And and this is kind of one of those pieces. So I didn't see Hedwig when it was at the Jane Tell, but I saw a lot of other stuff like this around that part of New York City that was kind of about the same, some of the same things kind of on a different level. This this piece is so interesting. Yeah, I um, think but we got to talk about John Cameron Mitchell. We do. I, I think we were also, we, we, I think Giuliani, it was referred to as the broken window syndrome. I think that's what they called it. Yes. Blight, urban blight. We can't have all these uh, queer kids and black and brown people hanging around. It's messing up our property values. <laughs> right. They're so messy. And, they're, um, and they, it was kind of the thing. Also, they were going after, you know, people went down to Soho because when my dad was a kid, Soho's where artists were and they had these big lofts. Yeah. Then they, they were abandoned. So then people made rock clubs and, and art galleries. Theaters. Theaters, and, yeah. lots of theaters. And people are serving drinks and people are being noisy. And then so then they got these cabaret licenses that they would throw everywhere and make it really mm-hmm. difficult for, for people to have a show. It's all yeah. of this. Yes, it brought the crime rate. Well, there's also people being planted with drugs by cops. I mean, there's also it was there was a lot of very unscrupulous um criminal activity by police officers that I don't know, you know, you and I were living there at the time. So we were very aware, like I still know those names of those officers and their victims. Yes. I don't know how much of a national story that was. I don't, I really don't know how aware the rest of the country was. Maybe they were, but I, I mean, I wouldn't know cause we were, you and I were living in the middle of it, but yeah, you, uh, you brought up a really important point too about the club scene and the party scene. Um, Because that plays into this as well. Mm -hmm. Um, If you've ever seen Party Monster, Mm -hmm. um, which is all about the club kids and the club scene. These parties where these young, uh, extremely marginalized youth, or if you've seen Paris is Burning, Mm -hmm. where they were able to have community and express themselves. Um, But yes, there's always this sort of criminal element, just kind of like always with the gay scene where you had the... Um, you had mobsters who were running the gay clubs right. and profiting off of their <laughs> marginalization. But that was all kind of swirling around when this show is is being birthed. But because of that also, it had the opportunity, like it didn't come out fully formed, the like we're seeing in the movie that we're going to discuss today. It had it had an evolution. And I was just watching, I was just saying before we got on, that I was just watching an interview with its creator, who we'll talk about right now, uh, John Cameron Mitchell. And he was talking about how, like, that wouldn't happen today. Like, a a theater piece wouldn't be allowed to grow 
and and evolve and find its sea legs the way that this piece was for him. And, you know, the way I think you and I could probably relate to that is you and I are both writers. And I got in with a writing group two and a half years ago, which completely changed everything for me because I'm able to send my samples around and I have these people that I respect who say, well, what about this? Or maybe add that, you know, I enjoy this part, maybe add some more of that. You need that feedback to grow a piece, especially when it's a theater piece. So let's talk about John Cameron Mitchell. Uh, He was what we would call an army brat here in America. His dad worked in the military and he lived all over the U S and in Europe he identifies as queer. He also says he hates labels and he's just kind of like at that age where he's like, ah, whatever. But he super creative. He went to Northwestern University. He's an actor and a playwright, a singer, screenwriter. I think a great film director. I think this movie is so gorgeously produced. The direction on this, agreed, is so good. But it's also, I mean, I'm not, I haven't really seen his other film work, but he was working, he was doing like episodes of MacGyver and stuff. Oh, you know, he was, this is, he was working, he was a working actor and, and then, you know, but also a very, obviously a very creative person. Yeah. And, and the thing about, I, about Brass, you know, I live in San Diego, which is a very, um, I'm not a military kid myself, but I was always surrounded by military kids. They're extremely what's the word adaptable they very you know they they really kind of land on their feet when life throws them into a new situation or you know having to they, they don't get thrown like <laughs> like I do we're like wait what like I was just saying before we got on the air like I don't know what day it is I, had, <laughs> I took one like road trip this week and I'm I was like I don't even know my middle name anymore they are really like I was always amazed at my military kid friends and neighbors that they just were like Nothing, nothing phased them. It seemed like it just like, oh, this is a new kid. Hey, come on, play with us. They, they were really, um, you just get, you get resilient. used to get you're resilient. That's the word I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. You learn how to fit in and also, but also I think in another way, yes, you learn how to fit in, which he's talking about, you know, as a queer kid, um, in a military situation, in those days, especially must have been a big factor. But I think also like with Hedwig in this piece, like you must also, I think, get to a point where you're like, you know what, this is just who I am. And if you guys, if you guys can't handle it, so what, three months later, we're going to be in another state. So deal with it. (laughs) I was an IBM kid, which in the 70s. Yeah, you moved around a lot. Yeah, we moved every two years. So and I remember like people be like, oh, my God, I would never be able to handle it. What did you do? I'm like, well, I didn't have a choice. I mean, that's just the life I was born into. But I think my strength is I'm fine being alone. I make friends pretty easily and I'm adaptable. I mean, the older I get, the more the less crap I'll put up with because I there's when you're in high school, it is more transactional your relationships with people. You got to see them every day you know, life is tough enough. You got to figure out how to get along with people. I have to sit next to this person for four years. So I better get along. Yeah. 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 And there's also, I always knew like, well, when I graduate, I'm going to go someplace else and do my own thing where I had a lot of friends who just stayed exactly where they were and didn't. So anyway, but so I always, I always relate to army brats. I just feel like we have a kinship there. And so this is, he's a queer kid. He's growing up in the, his, his, so he's 1963, the 70s and 80s. He's like a big Mm -hmm. pop culture fan of Bowie, Warhol, Prince, Patti Smith, all these things. There was a lot of kind of gender, what we would now say gender fluid exploration going on in art and and music in particular. Yeah. This is not new. This is something like we were just Mm -mm. talking about off the air because what's going on, CPAC conference is going on and somebody says right now now and said, we need to get rid of transgenderism (laughs) as if it's a thing that hasn't existed for decades, if not centuries. Yeah. But it's just an entire group of people that it's inconvenient for him to acknowledge their existence. And there's like, this is a movie mm-hmm. that's 20 years old and we yeah. still freak people out. It just, Oh yeah. At, why? I mean, I get, 
I think it's called short bus. There's, there's films that are very sexually explicit yeah, short that bus. he's done. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know that one is. I haven't ever seen it, but oh, I, no, no, no. I remember hearing about it. I get I get very like, ooh, I don't know. He but he's also he was the boss <laughs> in Shrill, which is AD Bryant's show on Hulu. Mm-hmm. Who he's playing Dan Savage, by the way, and he does a great job. Yeah. He was in Carol at Joe versus Carol. That was also mm-hmm. a streaming show. If you're looking for, he was also Margo. He was in uh, the Stepford Kids, which was a teenage <laughs> Stepford thing in the seven, in the eighties. He's done. He's always done. Been able to. He's in that sweet spot. He's always able to find work as an actor. Yeah, but he's never been stuck in one role until he created. Well, one. he has. Yeah, and he. Ha- but he has a very kind of like Americana apple pie white kid. Yeah. Uh, Look, vibe that kept him working. Yeah. And um, but obviously like a super creative force. Hedwig, he said the character of Hedwig, it was influenced by a babysitter that he had at yes. some point. And Hedwig, the character is a babysitter. That's how she meets um, Tommy. But we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, I just want to talk real quick about the Jane Hotel. Yes, please. Um, cause I remember it. it's still there. Is it like a luxury billionaire place now too? It probably is. I didn't even, Ugh, I know. I don't even want to know. I really don't even <laughs> want to know The the meat packing, you guys, the meat packing district in the nineties was so cool. It was really cool. And then like Alexander McQueen moved in. It, uh, Pastis. But, um, Florent, did you ever go to Restaurant Florent? Have we talked about Restaurant Florent before? No, I was a pastis Ugh. girl. Like if, anytime I could go there and get their steak and fri- their steak frites, I saw Julianne Moore there. All of a sudden, like it was this meatpacking district and they did a lot of photo shoots there. I worked in magazines, mm-hmm. so a lot of fashion shoots were done there because they're just off the road and it's kind of like, and um, it, was a, it was a place There's- where sex workers oh, could work. And it was absolutely. Yeah, you would go and you would see them at any hour of the day. There is a wonderful I mean, I never get tired of watching them, but there was a wonderful, wonderful young man named Nelson Sullivan. You know, Nelson Sullivan. Mm -mm. So he lived in the meatpacking district during this time. Uh, He died very young. He died in like 1990 or something like that. Anyway, um, but he lived there as that area evolved. He owned a house in the meatpacking district and he lived there as the area evolved in the 80s into the 90s and um, was friends with artists and sex workers. And he knew the thing is he, he owned a video camera and he videoed that whole era like everywhere he went he had a camera and everybody knew no there's nelson with his camera he knew um all of the artists all of the club kids lady bunny rupaul when they were baby 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 artists and um so there are there is beautiful film of him like hanging out with rupaul in a bodega after rupaul was go-go dancing at the such and such club and, you know, and they have no money at all. He was very good friends with RuPaul. I think he knew him from Atlanta because he was from the South. His house. OK, hold on. I got to go. I'm going to go online for just a second because I want to make sure I get this right. OK. So Nelson Sullivan's house um, at 5 9th Avenue and Gansevoort Street. So right in the heart of the oh, meatpacking wow. district. It is now an art gallery. It's sort of a museum because, I mean, he has this, what he did was create this incredible archive and um, of culture at that time. You can find most of his video on YouTube and go and watch it. It's amazing. There is a whole, there's a several videos where he goes and visits RuPaul at the Jane Hotel because RuPaul lived there. It was sort of a flop house and RuPaul was living there with some other Again, sex workers, you know, hustlers, but also artists, drag performers. Um, And there are several videos of the inside of the Jane Hotel in those days. And it's because it hadn't been redone at all. So it was like this beautiful turn of the 19th into the 20th century, decrepit hotel. It was a hotel that also housed uh, families of victims of the Titanic, I believe. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it has a lot of history. And I think it might have been for a time, it might have been one of those women only hotels like in Bosom Buddies. <laughs> um, when I first moved to New York City, I had a gym in one of those places. They still existed back then. But anyway, if you want to see what the Jane Hotel looked like, what I'm saying is we want to see what Jane Hotel looks like right before this 
this show started. It's, you know, just a couple of years before you can go and look up Nelson Sullivan on YouTube, Nelson Sullivan, Jane hotel, and you will see some amazing footage of the late eighties meatpacking district. Uh, RuPaul is a, like I said, as a teeny kid, uh, very tall, but very young, very ambitious and hungry. <laughs> and so the, the show he starts, so he's doing the show like, in the basement of the Jane Hotel, I think, right? It was in the basement. He, it was in a few different places. So he, he, he became friends with Stephen Trask, who's another actor and a musician. And they, it, it developed, it was a drag show, but he always wanted, he was, a, he was a rock kid. And he said, they're never, yeah. there's never good rock music in these rock musicals. He says, like, except for Tommy. No, especially in those days. Yeah. Like Rent. No. Which is, it's not rock. It's a musical. It's, it's not. Not like that. Not like this is. And so, yeah, but when the when the show first starts, it's all covers. The music. Right. That, it has completely different music is what we're saying. And so he's singing. She, Hedwig, is singing covers of other musicians' songs and probably a very kind of punk rocky sort of yeah. way, I would imagine. And Cher. And Cher. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah. And Debbie, excuse me. And Debbie Boone, who does you, Pat, Pat. I mean, you might, even not, you might not even know who Pat Boone no, is. No, no. Um, but anyway, she's saying, you light up my life. Famously uh, sang a song, a love song about Jesus uh, <laughs> that made a, made the top 40 in the United States. But it was just kind of like a, like a workshop, you know, sort of a thing. And so it had time and room to have it build an audience that it was interacting with. It was just this kind of like growing living organism thing that was evolving and changing. Um, but always around this character of Hedwig, who I think also, I think Hedwig was not the central character at first, right? I don't remember that. Uh, I listened to an amazing podcast and it's called the things that made me queer. And they did an, Ooh. it's really fantastic. And it's uh, the January 19th episode. And I don't know if this year or if it's a previous year, but he, he does mention that it was like this living thing that the, he would play a share song one night and then they would come up with a Bowie song, but they were constantly moving it around. And Hedvig is, you know, it's tra they, they gender queer is, is how they label it. He makes it very specific that anybody can be Hedvig. It's not, it's an idea. It's a, it's a, right. It, it's not just one specific thing. And sometimes people get very dogmatic about it. Like what, mm -hmm. and his whole thing is like, it could be anybody. It's just about creativity, how we use drag to, and music to get through the hard times, to connect with people. It's all yeah. about all of that. And so he worked mm -hmm. with this amazing band and uh, one of them was his boyfriend, one of the band members. But they, they basically, they developed along and then they had Itzhak join the band and it became mm -hmm. this performance. And so they couldn't get places in New York because they keep getting shut down, you know, because of the Giuliani era of the cabaret laws. Right. So they didn't have as the kind of theater. So they created a theater at the Jane Hotel. And it mm -hmm. had like 280 seats, I think he says. And he says it was playing to like half full. And then what happens is they get fans like they're just coming back again and again, but also celebrities like Bowie. And he, he loves to make fun of Madonna. <laughs> he's not a big Madonna fan, but he's like, Oh yeah, she showed up. But all these like, and once Bowie and Madonna and the other cool kids show up to a thing, it takes over. And so it didn't. Right. So it, it became like a cool well, ticket. Yeah. And also then, the the Giuliani's of that time mm -hmm. as today they're like oh oh this is a this is a like a tourist attraction so this is actually making the city money so okay all right Hedwig yeah we won't we won't completely shut you down so anyway yeah it had it had room and I saw I mean you and I I'm sure you did too I saw so much theater in that in yeah. that time but stuff that was in like abandoned storefronts I mean, just not not your conventional theater because, again, the Giuliani stuff um, was really a real thing that was very difficult for artists to contend with. And, and it made it very difficult. But you can't you can never stop art. No, <laughs> no matter what you do, you're never going to stop it. Um, so, yeah, people would do them, you know, 
in all kinds of unconventional non-theater spaces. There was a lot of interesting theater going on. Um, and I bet there is right now too, with, again, with this, with this billionaires uh, running everything. I bet you, I bet there's art kind of, I, I don't know where they're doing it now cause I'm not there, but, yeah. but I bet it's going on in some kind of weird spaces that we wouldn't think of because of, this is all getting to the point that, When you read the script of Hedwig and the Angry Inch, it takes it's very quick because there's not much that's actually written down (laughs) except for the lyrics of the songs. Right. Really that much, Um, because so much of it is about that interaction with the audience. And because it is a kind of, you know, it's what's in the script is just the skeleton of it, basically. And it's really cool when you read it because you can imagine like, oh yeah, a director or a performer can really kind of take this any number of ways. It's, it's. I was very interested by this script. I, 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 uh, I was surprised. Um, On the front page, they say yeah, to you, it's, make it local. Make it. Yeah, make it local. Ugh. You totally can. Call out it, the landmarks in your town. Anywhere. Yes, and that was the whole point. It could be said in any country, any, any state language. in the U.S. Yeah, any language, absolutely. Yeah, it's super cool. I really like it. Yeah, it's so. It's, so Hedvig <laughs> is is somebody who she has. We. Oh, well, let's get into the plot, basically. Then it's a, yeah. So so just just the structure of it. Um, you, you as the audience, your what your experience as the audience member is is like you are. So it, it's supposed to be sort of like um, I gather sort of like a dinner theater sort of setting, right? Um, you're not in a, you're not in a rock venue. You're in like a diner or it's, it, it, or she's alluding, she alludes to that. You're in like a restaurant or something like that. Right. But the whole show is this kind of cabaret show that you're, you, the audience member is watching with these songs, these excellent songs. Yeah. I can't believe like they didn't even have these songs when they started, which really tells you a lot about his performance must right. have been like really amazing but you the audience member are in between these songs getting little bits and pieces of Hedwig's life story uh what is the deal is this a trans woman is this a drag queen what who is this Hedwig and why are we watching her while I'm trying to have my Salisbury steak right (laughs) she's born in Germany uh, right as the Berlin Wall goes down. I love this plot. I think it's so good. It's so, it's so brilliant. Because it could happen. It's plausible. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. And and Hedwig, she's, Hedwig's born a boy. And then Hedwig meets someone. He's queer. He meets someone. And they want to move to the U.S., but they're afraid that they're going to have to go through... Ye- a physical in order. Right. Well, because this is during the cold war. Right. Um, he is living in East Berlin. Um, he's living in Eastern Europe. He's living in, you know, the communist bloc and he falls in love with an American serviceman who says, you know, and famously, I mean, we, I, we talked, we talked about the Berlin wall at some point, maybe yeah. I don't, I can't remember what for, but we did. Um, and we talked about how the many ways that people tried to escape East Berlin. You know, people died. People were, were shot trying to Maybe trying to cabaret. Escape. Maybe. Yeah. But that's before that era. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, it came up at some point. We, we, nine years, folks. And this man, this American service man is like, I love you. I want to marry you. I want to get you out of here, which is huge. And so Hedwig's like, and Hedwig at that point is Hansel his real name is Hansel Mm -hmm. um he's like yes I love you let's do it but here's the problem the the army won't let me get you out of here unless we're married we have to get married here in Germany and Germany East Germany won't let me marry you unless they make sure that I'm marrying a woman right so mm, Uh, right bad news for you Hansel and Hansel's mom is like oh I know the perfect doctor (laughs) You take my, her her name is Hedwig. You take my passport. You say you're me. um, And we'll get this doctor snip, snip, and you'll be on your way. Enjoy your, your life of freedom in the U S. 
Um, but it doesn't go to plan. It gets botched. His his, Oof. and it's a whole line in the song. His sex change got botched, and he. So that's his angry inch. That's <laughs> in case you were wondering. It's yeah. not just the name of the well, band. That's not, <laughs> that's not the same as being a trans woman. So no. he, this is a gay young man who is in love with the man and wants to be with the man, and so um, it's not somebody who feels. You know, it's a very interesting, especially for that time, but but so relevant today. Yeah, I I just uh, it's really cool. But it all expressed in this awesome, awesome rock music. So they get to the States because his mother wants him out of Germany. She wants him him to go to America and he might be better off there. He might have more. He's definitely going to have more freedom to be himself. Luther seems to love him. Yeah. Yeah. So this is all good. So he goes, and just as the Berlin Wall is coming down, he's being dumped by his American boyfriend husband. Yeah. Who leaves so him for it was all else. kind of for nothing. Like if he, you find out, but they didn't know that, right. you know. But if, but in 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 the if he had just waited like a year, it could have been fine. Um, but there was no way to know that, and now it's too late, and the surgery has been botched. And this husband has left for an, a man because he he's a gay man. So he leaves for a man. And um, and there's Hedwig in a in a foreign country with no resources who now has to make. And she goes by she um, has to make her way. Right. Um, yeah. She's always referred to as she in the script. We should talk about um, also the cast the way that the um the cast is and i and i was a little confused and you can help me out cuz you've seen it on stage so the main characters are again you you the audience are at at a restaurant or something watching this show and all of this has already happened in the past but you're you're getting Hedwig's past as you're watching it so there's the band mm-hmm. um led by Hedwig and Yitzhak. And Yitzhak is always played by a woman, mm-hmm. even though it's supposed to be a man. Right. Um, but it's not supposed to be a woman. It, it's just, a, it's just again, another layer of forcing the audience to think about gender roles, gender norms. You know, what does that mean? And all of that. In the story, though, Yitzhak is Hedwig's husband, is a man and is Hedwig's husband. Right. right? And am I also correct that... Um, so that what I'm trying to say is there's nobody playing the husband, the, the Luther, who's the American serviceman who, who takes him out of East Berlin or the other lovers and so on. It's Hedwig is saying both roles, right? Right. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I was understanding that correctly and, in the script. Cause that's the movie is totally different. You have actors playing these people. Yeah. Um, well, it's okay. like, is a, is sings is, is a woman playing sings a man playing a book. Yes. And it's, Mm-hmm. And so when Itzhak has a great voice as a belter and the whole thing is that uh, and, he, and he has she has Itzhak's passport. They they had a relationship, but it's it's not romantic anymore. And Itzhak is sort of forced, but also loves Hedvig. But yeah. but Itzhak has moments where he wants to break out of his shell. You know, he's he's sporting like facial hair and, and this kind of macho preening and but he wants to play the higher notes and he wants to sing more and Hedvig is like now Hedvig is the star you you just go over there then there's a point where Hedvig is uh so that one of the best I think songs ever and if you ever need a pick-me-up song it's it's wig in a box like if I ever really it's a great song it's like so goddamn cheerful it's so wonderful but he basically he takes his wig off the box like he's just okay he's been in america now so now i gotta figure out a way how to make a living and he does some sex work and he does some babysitting work and he meets tommy gnosis which is a a young man who wants to be a rock star doesn't know Mm -hmm. how to do it doesn't not not quite sure but it's really handsome Tommy is the teenage son of a, it's like a colonel or a general mm-hmm. um, that Hedwig is babysitting for. Um, so again, Hedwig is based on a babysitter that John Cameron Mitchell had as an army kid, um, as a military kid. 
So it's a little bit of that story. Um, but they they fall in love. But then Tommy finds out um, about Hedvig and the angry inch and what's going on. And he gets freaked out and leaves. And then Tommy goes off and takes the songs that Hedvig's been creating for the last couple of years. And he becomes a rock star. So Hedvig has to live like this life where she's just scraping by a living, you know, going from gig to gig and finding a band where she can and finding a space where she can. And then in the same town, Tommy knows this is at the stadium and is, and it's like, that's, and it's her music. And I think like the record label wants, and she's the one who names him Tommy Gnosis. Right. Cause his name is Tommy Speck. Right. So Which you, I love. And gave him like his sexy <laughs> makeover and all this stuff like that. But he, mm-hmm. but he freaked out and then takes off. And so then, um, so, she has to play these smaller gigs and she's and her whole story is just like she gets dumped on and she figures out a way to get out of it and rock music was like her savior and punk rock was her savior but also the drag you know drag movement and and being in drag and in the audience sometimes there's kids that follow her and they wear the wigs and stuff basically at the end itzak gets her chance uh, gets his chance to speak to sing and be and then be in full yeah. drag over the course of the and again like the script is very sparse yes <laughs> it is really the script is really mostly just the song lyrics but um so it was hard for me having never seen it on stage to kind of piece together what was happening but i if i understand correctly by the end of through the course of the show where hedwig is telling you this story like tommy um Tommy's fame with her songs and her art, he's stolen her art and her heart mm-hmm. also left her having to scrape by, like Margot said. And and really the, the more famous he is, the more kind of oppressed Hedwig is. He she she can't rise as long as Tommy is this huge star. And over the course of the piece, Hedwig realizes that that's what she's doing to Yitzhak, mm-hmm. right? Right. And so at the very, very end, um, there's this song that they do and, and, and Hedwig basically kind of says, kind of says to Yitzhak, kind of gives Yitzhak like the blessing, like basically I'm sorry. And, you know, you should go and, and, and be who you need to be. And, and Yitzhak is the one who kind of has the happy ending of the piece right because Hedwig is still Hedwig is still Hedwig Hedwig is still doing what she was doing you know it's still the same show for the audience you're still in you're watching this one cabaret show while you're having your your stake and and so Hedwig's life is has not changed the circumstances of her life does not change in the piece but Yitzhak's does by the end Yitzhak's life is about to take off um and that's how that's what Hedwig that's Hedwig's evolution is being able to open her heart and and do that um for for Yitzhak and um and, and it's I mean it's a fun it's a the script is very fun yeah um I wish I, like I said I so wish I could have seen it live because I bet it's really awesome I'm just so impressed even just reading the script I'm so impressed by John Cameron Mitchell that not just to write this not just the writing of it which is excellent but and the, and the lyrics and the music which are excellent but um to be performing these multiple roles throughout the thing, you know, having conversations, Hedwig is having conversations with Luther, with his parent, her parents, with Tommy, you know, back and forth, back and forth. But it's all just, that's all John Cameron Mitchell doing the whole thing. Right. It's quite something. Yeah, it does. I mean, it off Broadway, it does really well. He had been, he gets the opportunity from Thank God, not Miramax, but with Focus Features. Yeah, whew. I know he dodged a bullet there. Focus Features gives him the ability, the rights to the they they pay for the rights to the story, and they're like, you direct it, you you're the creator. Well, yeah, the, um, he knew somebody. I saw two interviews one one with him and one with um, the woman who plays Itzak. There's Ooh, Miriam Shore name? plays her. Miriam Shore is yes. the one who plays her in the movie. Uh, anyway, but she also knew she had known uh, John Cameron Mitchell. They'd known each other for years and years. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think she had played that role. No, no, no. But she knew him. Anyway, 
the movie before it went into production they were talking with it was something like where it had gotten into a program through sundance Mm -hmm. (laughs) suddenly blanked on robert redford's name it's been a week folks (laughs) um robert redford because john cameron mitchell had never directed a movie or directed a television or anything like that robert was like no listen you know you want to make sure you do this right you gotta get a, a real director, a real film director to do this. Um, and he's like, listen, I'll tell you what, we'll get this. They, they picked somebody. You direct this scene. And, and then John Cameron Mitchell, you also do the same scene. And let's, let's see what we see. And w- there was no contest. Like, Oh, once they saw somebody else handling the material versus John Cameron Mitchell, who knows it inside out, upside down, mm-hmm. knows where Hedwig was, then knows where Hedwig's going to be in 30 years. So that's when they decide, okay, well, he should be the one to do it. But so I don't know. I mean, I know it must have been really hard all those years doing Hadwig, doing those multiple roles, evolving, doing those songs. But then and now I'm now I'm directing the movie and I'm in it and doing all that stuff. Man, it's a lot of pressure. Yeah, it's Uh, just a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Let's play the trailer. Like right now, we'll play the trailer and then we'll get into this movie. Ladies and gentlemen, whether you like it or not. Ow! Hedwig! Don't you know me, Kansas City? I'm the new Berlin Wall. Try and turn me down. How did some slip of a girly boy become the internationally ignored song stylist barely standing before you? Damn, that's... I can't believe you're not a girl. Looks like we got some sugar daddies in the house. You could give me a cavity, honey. <laughs> now you're interested, huh? Inch, no. not itch. Intrigue. It is clear that I must find my other half. But is it a he or a she? Can two people actually become one? The dark turns and noise of this wicked little town. One day in the late mid 80s, I was in my early late 20s. I never knew that woman before that night, and I never knew she wasn't a woman. I've got a sweet tooth. Songs exploded out of us. We were outgrossing monster trucks in Wichita. When it comes to huge openings, a lot of people think of me. I had tried singing once, and they threw tomatoes. So after the show, I had a nice salad. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, both of you. And the angry hits. When I think about all the people I have come upon in my travels, I have to think about the people who have come upon me. <laughs> this movie comes out in 2001. It's written and directed by John Cameron Mitchell because he knew everything he wanted to do. Miriam Shores and there. Andrea Martin plays the manager. So they take Phyllis Stein. Get it? <laughs> Miriam Shore. I is love great. her. Oh, I love her. I, I, I love Andrea Martin. She's a national, international treasure. She's Canadian. Michael Pitt is Gnosis, Tommy Gnosis. And he has the band that's from the show and he takes the action and it's at different spots around America, which it's just so clever. I love the one where he's in the the Asian with the Asian band behind them, all women. When they're they're saying, all yeah, they're all um like Korean army wives or something like that. Um, interestingly, the the movie release date is September twelfth, two thousand and one. Yeah, yeah. It, it, wow, that's not great luck, is it? No. It doesn't 
what happens is in a couple of years it comes out on DVD and then yeah and then the Sundance channel plays it all the time I know it like I used to watch it on Sundance yeah channel. I think that was kind of instrumental in terms of its like sleeper um hitness because yeah it just became this kind of like oh yeah people really talking about Hedwig and the Angry Inch and like oh well, did you see it da, 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 da. it's so good I it's he takes the action it's super super good I love that it's different audiences like sometimes it's like a supper club kind of audience I love he plays the sugar yeah. daddy song so and he's just climbing the, oh it's awesome <laughs> In the in the play in the script, um, as we said, you the experience is that you, the audience member, are a patron at this restaurant, diner, or whatever it is, and you're watching the floor show, which is Hedwig and the Angry Inch. In the movie, we've added this extra layer where the band Hedwig, the band, is following, is kind of trailing Tommy's band around the country, but they're playing in these little diners, so you get that experience. But you also have this extra thing. So Phyllis is his manager slash lawyer who's kind of pursuing a lawsuit because Tommy stole this material and they're trying to prove it, that they know each other. Tommy's like, I don't know who this who this crossdresser is. Like, Yeah, he tries. Um, uh, he tries it. But um, so I like that. I think that's such a cool device as he's going around. It has Hedwig is going around the U.S., playing in these little diners there is like margo said like there's a little he they have he's a little, like fan base a little cult following like a half dozen people <laughs> who follow the band around and i don't know you tell me if this was like what the stage experience was like seeing it on stage on broadway but one of the things i really like about the movie is how how intimately hedwig talks to the audience mm-hmm. it's this loud rock punk rock music da, 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 But then in between, and I'm sure this is what it was like live, you know, at the Jane Hotel, but I don't know about Broadway, but in between when when she's talking to the audience, who are strangers, um, she's sharing like super personal stuff about herself. And she's doing it in a very kind of really super personal, intimate, quiet way. It's funny because... Is that how it was? So in so I didn't see it on Jane Street, which will always be... It's one of those regrets that I have because yeah, it, right. It just, I know me too. I've, I've got those regrets. It was just like, nah, I don't want to go. I mean, I, I'm sure that's. A- <laughs> I I'm sure I didn't know what it was. I'm sure I was broke. Let's be clear. I was probably even broke for too broke for you know off Broadway in '97. So what happens is that in the movie he does these sh- these shows and he has this little fan base and it's mostly a curious audience, but for the most part, people are good sports because it's great music. It's really fun. He's also super funny i mean he is on top of just being the great, hilarious he is hilarious very good jokes in this in this very, very sparse script it's got solid. super good jokes mm-hmm. when you go to we'll play a little clip here that i found someone uh, recorded a bit of neil patrick harris so this is 2014 uh, you know obama's in office like everything's yay we're we're, we're progressive i was up in the nosebleeds obviously because i Remember when we thought that for a minute? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do. Oh, I do. But so I'm up in the nosebleed. So you have to play it to this huge crowd. And so half of it is going to be, well, let's say third. So a third of it's going to be the hardcore fans. 
a third of it's going to be people who have money and came to New York and they'll see anything and they love everything or they love Neil Patrick Harris. Then there's a third of us that are just like, well, it's a show. I hear it's good. I'm going to go check it out. Right. So <laughs> Doogie Hauser's in a show. Right. And so we still call him that because we're from the 80s. But he goes out on stage. Thank you so much. You're so kind. I do love a warm hand on my entrance. <laughs> my name is Hedwig. Please welcome the Angry Inch. <laughs> and my husband, Man Friday through Thursday, Yitzhak. <laughs> I am thrilled that you have joined me on this special one-time-only performance at the beautiful Belasco Theatre. Look at me on Broadway. Yeah! East of Broadway. <laughs> Ebra. Welcome to Ebra, ladies and gentlemen. You're here tonight courtesy of Bob Wankel of the Schubert Organization. On bended knee did I beg Bob for my Broadway debut. <laughs> He told me not to talk with my mouth full. <laughs> How did some slip of a girly boy from communist East Berlin become the internationally ignored song stylist barely standing before me? <laughs> That's what I want to talk about tonight. I'm not here to talk about it. And I remember he's so tall, thin, 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 like, you know, Patrick House, Her Hedwig, the productions I've seen is a very thin person, but he says you could be any size to be Hedwig, but you're playing like a rock star of the seventies. So it's like that Iggy pop, David Bowie. And so he's jumping around the audience. He's spitting water into the crowd. He would jump into people's laps, loved it. People, he was motorboating women in the front row. Like they loved it. It was, but when they had to go to the quiet stuff, it really worked. You know, there's just, he's a good actor. He's a really good actor. And, and you, you like, he you like Hedwig right away. Like she's got an you ego. Do. Sure. But mm -hmm. she's got something to back it up. And there's something. She's very got an ego, but she, you're, you're, you're in a, like a Denny's. <laughs> yeah. Or she's just, yeah, she, she knows who she is. She knows, she doesn't, mm -hmm. put, she doesn't put on airs like that. So she, so when he does it, it's like he's, he's kidding with the crowd. And he's like, look at us at the Belasco Theater. And it's this gigantic theater. It was so much fun. It was just so much fun. And it's fun to do like wig in a box when they had everybody singing with it. And it was, it was just fantastic. And I, I, I brought a friend and she was like an immediate convert, like had no idea what it was, anything was even about. And she was an immediate convert. But so to go back to the story, the, the art mm -hmm. direction, this movie is so, so amazing. The, the, makeup, we have, oh, the, the makeup is beautiful. All the makeup is so good. Cause you have Yitzhak who is a woman. And again, it never is like, that's a woman. It's, it's fine. It's fine. This is the world that we're in. The animation, there's a lot of animation that happens. Beautiful. It's gorgeous. I love the scenes where I, I really like, like I said, I liked the, the idea of Hedwig and the band uh, following Tommy yes. around the country. I love when she's playing the women's festival. I forget what it was called. The Menses festival or something <laughs> like that. And there's only one person in the audience and Hedwig's like, oh, screw it. Okay, just come up here and sit down. I'll just, I'll why just am I shouting at you on the microphone? Just come sit over here and we'll talk. It's so good. I just All night Like this When the world's a bit a mess And the lights go down Across the trail apart I get down, I feel hot, feel on the verge of going mad, and then it's time to punch the clock, I put on some makeup, turn on the tape deck, and put the wig back on my head. 
Suddenly I am Miss Midwest Midnight Check out Queen Until I head home And I put myself to bed the way the um the flashbacks to his childhood. East Berlin are done and the way that whole thing about the wall coming down is all handled um because in the script it's just Hedwig telling you about right. it um and I think the, the the I like Hedwig's like trailer that she lives in and all of it, the, it it's super super well done and I think the choices that they made in taking it to um, the big screen were really good. They they made it bigger, but they also made it smaller. Like they made it bigger in that they're tra- they're traveling. It's a traveling show, which it's not at all, of course, in the theater version. But it's smaller in that you get much more. When Hedwig tells you about her inter scenes with Tommy or scenes with Luther, her husband, in the stage show. Again, Hedwig's doing both pieces and is telling it's a story that she's telling you in the movie. We're in the room with these two, um, right. these two people, these two humans in very, very, very intimate uh, moments with them as their relationships are growing or shrinking. And it's done super well, I think. I think Michael um, Pitt's really good as Tommy knows. He's super good. Yeah. He and and he's playing, you know, he's hot. He's young and he's hot. He's not that bright. Mm-hmm. But Hedwig loves him and trusts him, but he can't make that commitment to her. Like that at the last second he just completely freaks out. So when they go to New York, they meet up in the meatpacking district, and that's where Hedwig is trying to make some money. And his limo is hustling. Like, I mean, yeah. they, they have run out Sex of money. And work. I like that too. Yeah, that as they, as the band is following Tommy, they're running out of money, running out of money, and they completely run out of gas. Hedwig is really getting, uh, is really exploiting Yitzhak, uh, is not being nice to anybody. Right. And Phyllis, his lawyer, walks away. And yeah, so she's got to live. So there she is. She's hustling in the meatpacking district. And she's, Meeting Tommy. So Tommy shows up in a limo uh, or in a car and they come and they start. And then there's this whole. Yeah, it's a limo. Oh, it's a limo. But Uh they're driving it at some point. Is is Tommy driving it? Yeah. So when it it starts out, um, which I really love. I love this in the movie. I think it's so cool. So the limo pulls up. First of all, there's a couple of of cars that pull up and see Hedwig and are like, nope. And they keep going. And then this limo pulls up. The door opens and it's Tommy. Who is surprised? To, they're both surprised to see each other. Tommy invites Hedwig into the limo, and at first they're riding in the back of the limo, and it's super awkward because they haven't seen each other. Hedwig's been basically stalking Tommy, and Tommy's pretending like I don't know who you are, I don't know who you are, and now they're sitting next side by side in the back of the limo, and Tommy's finally kind of like okay, pulls out a CD of his and says puts ads Hedwig's name to the you know words and lyrics by. Or you know, music and lyrics by. Then we have a jump cut, and now Hedwig and Tommy are driving the limo. They're now in the front of the limo, so we don't know what happened. They dismiss the driver at some point. We don't know. Fire shot down from the sky in bolts, like shining blades of a knife, and it ripped right through the. 
children of the sun and the moon and the earth. And some Indian god sewed the wound up into a hole, pulled him round to a better to remind us of the price we pay. And, and the Cyrus, the gods of the now. Wait, did you say the Cyrus? No, no, the, you just sang the Cyrus on that recording. The Cyrus, Cyrus, the, Cy the Cyrus, the god. It's a, there's no god called Cyrus, it's Osiris, it's an Egyptian god. Remember we read that book? We right. Um, I don't know, but now they're driving and it's getting even more real and they're talking to each other and they get distracted and, spoiler alert, they... um they drive into a truck so they're having an argument over lyrics yeah because tommy doesn't understand the lyrics that because <laughs> that Vic is very like oh, that's right, serious about her greek like, and her her tragedies and like the words that she that's uses right, and she's that's yelling right. at him like you don't even know what i'm talking about they're so dumb they're so he's so dumb yeah. so then they crash and then it's tommy all of a sudden it's like rock star with a gay wo you know woman with a woman yeah. or a gay man you know it's all the yeah. he headlines and then hedrick's like yeah this is what i've been yeah everybody for. finally knows this is what i wanted yes. the whole time and yeah. so so hedwig now is that's her that's her claim to fame now and so now no matter where she goes no matter where she's playing people know she wrote those songs and that's but also like the 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 movie ends the same way that the stage show ends in that hedwig um hedwig is finally kind of hedwig now is completely hedwig and um is you know if free to express his or herself however they want to which i think is great i mean yeah. it's this whole big climactic number and that's in the stage show too and also she realizes you you haven't been so great to yitzhak you need to it's time to let yitzhak go and and live his dreams um yeah and it's it's just gorgeous i love the whole end of the movie i think is so good loved it he Ends it in the film on stage. He just kind of goes off in the back, like he just sort of takes mm -hmm. off. But in the movie, kind of walks off. He's naked. He has like yeah. a tattoo on the side of his hip, and then he walks away from the camera. Like he's just who he is now. There's no mm -hmm. artifice. There's no whatever. He's and it's it's a great message. It's and it's not a message movie, by the way. It's it's just a, no. It's fun. It's Sad just about sometimes. it's a story yeah, it's of a, a story. life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's beautiful. And it's the I love the shot of him where he was talking about his childhood and his parents made him like go to the garage or the basement to listen to his music because he was so loud. And the, then there's in that the shot. oven. Yeah. In the He's oven. got his head in the oven. Right. Right. And then like because the, they live in East Berlin. And so they have this little communist apartment. <laughs> it's just I mean, all the, the it's it's gorgeously filmed. It looks great it's it's i love that little boy too that plays oh, him as a little boy he's so, so good. good so good and yeah we rosie o'donnell makes an appearance here I, it's because then they find out that you know hedwig is actually the star of the and she used to have people yeah. with musicals on her show all the time when Rosie had a talk was show. talking yeah john cameron mitchell was talking about so when it started to get kind of cool when the show started to get kind of cool the stage show the first time around in the 90s he would get invites to perform on television, on talk shows. And he said that most of the time, the networks would be super strict, like, don't take your wig off during the performance. Um, he, I think he was saying, telling me about how he was on David Letterman. And the, the, stu the production uh, was like, do not under any circumstances because they didn't want Americans, the American audience to like go, oh, 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 it's a man in a wig until my television set. 1230 so at he, night, by the way. I mean, yeah, in the middle of the night. Right? But anyway, he said, so he, he takes his wig off after the song was over. He, he took the wig off and he said like David Letterman wouldn't shake his hand. <laughs> and, um, but Rosie O'Donnell was like, come on the show, do whatever you want to do, was super, super, super supportive of the show. And he mentioned somebody, oh, Bill Maher, he said. He said Bill Maher, like, freaking loved the show, had him on, um, was singing the songs. <laughs> That's when he had Politically Incorrect. Right. Because um, it was a while ago. But so, yeah, so he had there. So there's footage of John Cameron Mitchell performing Hedwig 
on Rosie O'Donnell, which they use in the movie, which I think was so brilliant. But yeah, he said that it was a very kind of people were like, oh, this is cool. And people are paying money to go see this show. So we want to make sure and feature it. But we also don't want to freak people out because cross-dressing. I mean, I know. Yeah. Yeah. When when I'm disappointed in David Letterman over Bill Maher, it's like that's a sad thing. <laughs> that's a sad state of affairs. But just saying. Just say it. I don't think they had that many problems when it was Neil Patrick Harris, um, because everyone Mm-mm. loves him. It's- everyone loves him. And and um, yeah, he was talking in that interview I saw. He was talking. They were talking a lot about Neil Patrick Harris, about how they'd known each other for a really long time. Neil Patrick Harris had gone and seen the show when it was at the Jane, I think. Um, he was super young, had seen it from backstage and was looking i think it was after he'd done rent Mm -hmm. and was looking that was his two yeah and was looking for always looking for he's always kind of he said he's the kind of person that's always looking for something that's going to challenge him that's going to be hard for him to do uh we talked about him when we talked about gone girl which i Mm -hmm. love him and gone girl but um but he john cameron mitchell was saying like he also understood that like being on broadway having a neil patrick harris is going to bring in people in to see the show who would never see it otherwise and he was right he was right i mean the crowd was just but they were in the pocket because they just as soon as he just does his because he's so charming i should we should also say this is a very physical performance if you're playing hedwig no kidding i saw the, the tony's performance that he did where he's like climbing up on the chair, putting his crotch in like uh, <laughs> Neil Patrick Harris whose face. Yeah. Whose face does he does he put his crotch in somebody's face? Somebody really famous, like not Samuel L. Jackson, but somebody like that, like a movie star uh-huh. who's in the front row of the Tonys. And like, <laughs> well, that's what he did Neil in the Patrick show. Harris, like, like I said, he motorboated his like he like he motorboated <laughs> women. And they're like, OK, <laughs> it's all- but it's so physical. He's got these yeah. huge chunky heels where john cameron mitchell was like i was sort of saying could i have shorter heels you know and and neil patrick was like give me the highest heels um jumping up climbing up on the amps and swinging down on the wires and like wow so neil patrick harris left the production and they brought someone else in and i can't remember who it was but it didn't do as well so they brought in john cameron mitchell back to do the role and that brought the box office but he hurt his hip like at this point, he could not do those leaps anymore. Oh my gosh, it's really something. It's very physical. So whoever you have, but I appreciate that he says because. So we should say that there are productions around the world, and there was going to be a huge one. This interview I listened to in Australia, which of all places you think would be like easy, but the casting they they were going to pick. I, I think it's a cis male. And Uh people had a problem with it and said, no, it needs to be a queer person. It needs to be a this or that. And the man, Uh the person that they were going to hire was so freaked out by the negative attention that they attempted to kill themselves. (gasps) Oh, my gosh. That's Uh, terrible. Yeah. I almost died by suicide. How awful. And then and Mitchell was like, anybody could be Hedvig. Anybody. Anybody. That's the point of my story. It could be a woman. I mean, woman. yeah, it could be, it could be anybody. A black person. It could be mm-hmm. a disabled person. It could be yeah, in a wheelchair. Totally. Like whoever. Like that's Hedvig is just a, it's a thing in your head. It's a it's, a, it's about being an individual. It's about embracing who you really are and throwing away old fashioned customs and just being yourself and being expressive. And this, it was just heartbreaking for him because it's the antithesis of the very message that I wanted to send. And so, you know, I hate ending it on that. I think we should end it on just that. It's a amazing production. It did win the Oscar. I'm excuse me. It did win a Tony for best revival of a show in 2015. It's, this is just one of my favorites. I was trying to see who took over Hedwig after Neil Patrick Harris. It was Andrew Reynolds who had played in Book of Mormon. I love Andrew Reynolds. No, Andrew Reynolds was good. I think it was somebody after Reynolds who was on Glee or something like that. The creator of Hedwig says it doesn't matter. It's, you know, it's it's a it's a it's the performance is just very challenging. You need to be somebody who's a good singer 
and is good with a crowd and and can and can do comedy because he was doing they don't write out the script he's just doing that patter in between the songs so he has to have some comedy chops too and he, I'm not sure. There's a lot of people who, who are listed here as playing it. And I also just like literally just now got the alert from the New York Times about the Tennessee law. Is it passed? I think it is. Yeah, I think it did. If you read it, it's the most ridiculous thing. Hold on. I'm not sure. Let me just see if it's passed. OK. Yeah. I, I mean, a bill signed into law this week in Tennessee makes staging, quote unquote, adult cabaret on public property or anywhere a child could see it is a criminal offense. What's adult cabaret? Yeah. The law forbids performances in those places by topless, go-go, exotic dancers, strippers, or male or female impersonators, who, as the law defines it, provides entertainment that is harmful to minors. Oh, for God's sakes. It's... I mean... Dolly Parton's from Tennessee. Do you see like how ironic that whole thing is? Like some right. I, What's she doing if it's not drag? I love her. I do too. I do too. I I, I know. We we got to keep fighting. We can't mm-hmm. because you you know you 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 get a little complacent. Yeah, and, and there they are. This happens. There they are, just waiting. I know. Drag queens have never hurt anyone. <laughs> so in other words, let's just be clear. In other words, like you couldn't do this show at a public venue in Tennessee, I don't think. No. Mm-mm. This is a show that's played around the world. Kids have seen this show, by the way. Don't want to shock you, but they have. There's n- there's no. Yeah, it's fine. There's no like, is there even any swearing? I'm not sure there's even any swearing. No, I mean, there's sex talk which would probably freak out my parents or it's, would have at the time. But I mean, it's not It's a big fairly deal. tame, though. Very in the tame, script, yeah. It's quite tame. Yeah, there's no nudity. Yeah. There's no... Mm-mm. No, but it's a man dressed as a woman and also a woman dressed as a man, like Yitzhak, let's not forget. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so sorry, Tennessee, you won't be seeing this show. Unless people want to go to jail, I guess. Gosh. It's... That's... Unbelievable. Just uh, appalling. I mean, seriously... Um, this is a case where book versus movie, I can't even say anything because I think every performance is different. And Yeah, true. And I've never seen it on stage. And like I said many times now, like the 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 script is so sparse mm-hmm. that, you know, it's so um, dependent on the individuals who are performing it and the venue and all of that. Um, it's kind of a new thing, I think, every time it's done, I gather. Um, so for us, I mean, unfortunately, we have to say movie because that's kind of the best thing that we have to go on. But the movie is so good. Watch it's the movie. Really, oh, it's awesome. It's so good. The it's, music is so everything. And get the soundtrack. Trust love me. It. It's funny. Wig in a box it's, will change your life. <laughs> <laughs> It's really good, you it's guys. It's so good. It's so good. And we're, we're lucky to live in a world that they have this. And mm. we still have it. And they still, the show still performs all over the world and definitely support it if you can, especially with this crap happening in Tennessee. Ugh. Okay. So I'm angry about Tennessee now. Can we do hairspray next? Yeah. We'll do the movie and then the. And the, and the, either do the movie and the script like we just did with this one, or do the, the musical and the original movie. Let's do that. Original movie and the musical. I, cause the yeah. original movie is one of my top favorites. Cause here's another one time. we can't show in, in Tennessee, I think. Yeah, probably. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Because of Edna. Or is it about live? Wait, I think it's about live performances. Well, they can't perform it. Yeah. No. One of the most beloved musicals ever, by the way. High schools do it. Yeah, they didn't think this through. Let's do hair. So we're going to do hairspray next. Yeah. Very excited. Very excited. Okay. I need to, I need to cheer up a we little bit. We need to cheer up. We me. need this. All right. Yes. We need John Waters. John Waters solves everything. <laughs> John Waters and Ricky Lake. Now. Let's now. Stat. <laughs> right to my brain. Right. Tracy Turnblad is one of my favorite characters of all time. She's 
a superhero. Amazing. Okay. I so love we'll her. do that next. Please send us your suggestions once again at all those places I mentioned. And once again, our email is book versus movie podcast at gmail.com. If you listen to us on Apple Podcasts, if you can leave us a five star review, we'll mention you on the air. And uh, Margo, where can they find you? You can find me online at coloniabook.com and all of my social media callouts are at She's Not Your Mama. And where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter at Brooklyn Margo. Instagram, it's at Brooklyn Fitchick. My site is brooklynfitchick.com and I am on the TikTok at Margo Donahue. And I'm putting more videos on there like I did for Hedwig and people Ooh. really like it. Yeah. So all of y'all be good. <laughs> yeah. Hang in there. Listen. To, Hang to in there, Tennessee. Listen to as much drag as you can while you can. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for listening to the Book Versus Movie Podcast. We are a part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more podcasts you will love at frolic.media forward slash podcasts. We follow the hashtags Lady Pod Squad and Potter and Family. If you want to support the show, you can go to our Patreon page, go to P-A-T-R-E-O-N and look for Book Versus Movie Podcast. We have a basic Facebook page, but we also have a private Facebook group. Go to Facebook and type in Book VS Movie Podcast Group if you want to join that. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Book Versus Movie. Spell all those words out. If you'd like to send us an email, it's Book Versus Movie Podcast. Spell that all out at gmail.com. You can follow Margot D at Brooklyn Fit Chick on social media and Margot P at She's Nacho Mama. Thanks so much again for checking out our show, and we'll be back soon with a new episode.